Hi guys, welcome to my channel and today's video is the first in the free to play series. In this series, I will look at what you get from the start and try to build competitive decks without spending money in the store for gems. This won't be an account I play every day, it's more aimed at the casual player who picks it up a couple of days a week to give them some ideas on how to gradually improve their decks based on realistic wildcard quantities to help more people enjoy Magic the Gathering. This first video is based on using the Stomp Stomp deck. This is the first dual colour deck you'll get after completing the mono colour challenges. I'm going to discuss the potential changes I would make to the deck, both with common and uncommon wildcards and with rare and mythic ones. I'll mostly be using common and uncommon wildcards in this video and series, but we will discuss possible rare wildcards we could also use. The footage playing now is a game with the base deck, and as you can see we're up against mono red. They've started by removing some of our early game creatures and it's caused us some problems as we can't really establish control on the board. They've also removed some of our mana generating creatures as well, so we're a little behind the curve that we would normally expect to be. Towards the end of the game we're in an okay spot but it's not amazing. We have no cards in hand and the board is fairly equal. Thankfully our opponent makes a small mistake by not fully blocking so we can use our Leafkin ability and scrape the win. Now I'm going to take through some of my proposed changes to the deck and why I think these will help. Before we start considering what cards to add to the deck, we need to consider what cards we can consider removing or reducing the number of. The first card we're looking at is Unleash Fury. Although its ability is good, we're generally aiming to be stronger than the opponent early anyway. The idea of the deck is to be ahead of the curve with power with cards like Rimrock, Knight and Bone Crusher Giant. So we're not necessarily needing this ability. So we could look at maybe getting rid of one or two of these. The second card we're looking at is the Nessian Horn Beetle. Although this is a good card and it kind of fits in well with the deck, it can be a bit inconsistent. It's only got two toughness and it's reliant on having a creature with power four or greater on the board. So what that means is it, it can be a bit inconsistent if the opponent has some removal that removes said creatures from the from the battlefield it could be easily removed before we've had time to develop it and get counters on it to make it useful the third card we're looking to change is the dreamstalker manticore we don't have that many instants in the deck and earlier in the game we're most likely going to be tapped out to get our creatures on the board to apply pressure with our power so we're not necessarily going to be playing instant in our opponent's turn that often, especially early on. If you couple that with the fact it's only got two toughness, which means it could be removed fairly easily with a one mana shock, for example, then you can see that it's not giving us that much value. If you compare it to the Bone Crusher Giant, for example, it's clear that the Bone Crusher Giant card offers us a lot more. Not only has it got an extra toughness and its shock ability when it's targeted by spells, it also gives us the instant adventure as well. Obviously, the Bone Crusher Giant is a rare card, but we have some ideas on how we can tweak the deck to get other cards that offer better value. The last card we're looking at is the Warden of the Chains. Although it fits the brief, its requirement for having another four power creature means it could be quite inconsistent, much like the Nessian Horn Beetle. Now we're going to start to look at some common and uncommon cards we can look at to add into the deck and why we think they will add value. The first card we're looking to add is called Grum Gully the Generous. Grum Gully the Generous is a three mana creature that has the ability of each other non-human creature you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. We only have the Horn Bash Mentor as a human creature in the deck, so this will buff a lot of the creatures in our deck. It's also a 3-3, so it's a bit better against some basic removal such as Shock, but its ability offers us a lot. The second card we're going to look at is called Pride Malkin. So Pride Malkin will combine very well with Grum Gully. Pride Malkin is a 3-mana creature, it's only a 2-1. But when Pride Malkin enters the battlefield, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature you control. Each creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it has trample. So basically what we're doing with Grumgully is we're feeding all our creatures tokens. And with Pride Malkin, now each of those creatures that got a token has trample. So what this does is this puts massive pressure on the opponent and their sort of life. Because 
we're going to get damage through to the opponent even if they have blockers it is worth pointing out this card is underpowered for its cost at, but if nothing else it's going to become more of a target for removal than some of your other creatures and also you can play this later in the battle too it doesn't have to be out until the creatures have got the 1-1 one, one token so if your opponent taps out on a turn the next turn you could just play this and you've at least got one turn of having all your creatures have ta have trample the third creature going to look at is the thrashing brontodon now this is a three four so it's on curve for power and it's got a good bit of toughness so it's a good blocker but it, its ability is something that the deck severely lacks so you tap one mana, you sacrifice Thrashing Brontodon. It actually destroys a target artifact or enchantment. It's something we don't really have in the deck, so it's useful against opponents. A lot of white decks will have a lot of enchantments and things like that, so it'll be useful to have those removal abilities. And if not, it's a creature on curve, and it's tough for a good blocker as well. And the last card we're looking to consider to add is the Keeper of Fables. Now, this is a five-mana creature. It's a four-five, and the ability is whenever one on or non-human creatures you control deal combat damage to a player draw a card as you saw with the standard deck game earlier in the video towards the end of that game we had no cards we were just drawing off the top of the deck if we can have a creature and gives us some draw and all of our creatures have trample from the pride malkin and grum gully we're more likely to deal combat damage to the player and therefore to trigger that effect so we think that will also help us in the deck. Now we're going to look at what rares and mythics could be useful for the deck. If you're new to the game, I'd be very cautious on using your wild cards early on, especially your rares and mythic rares, because they're not that easy to get hold of. Also, as this is a free-to-play account, I currently don't have any mythic rares, and I have very few rares. So I won't be adding any of these myself. But if you're a player that likes this deck and will be using it a lot, then consider adding some of these cards to give your deck a bit extra. The first one we know about is the Bone Crusher Giant. The Bone Crusher Giant is just an excellent card. It's a three mana four three. It has the instant adventure ability. It has basically two removal, a uh, two damage for any target. So it's some basic early removal. And then also when it's targeted by a spell, it does two damage to that spell's controller. It's just a very excellent card and most red decks you'll encounter later on will be running possibly even four of these. It just offers very good value and the fact it has the instant as well just means it's extremely versatile as well and it's very unlikely this card won't be useful in a red deck. The second card we're going to look at is the Elder Gargaroth. Elder Gargaroth is a 6-6 six, six creature with Vigilance, Reach and Trample. As well as that, though, it actually has an ability. Whenever it attacks or blocks, you either create a 3-3 green beast creature token, gain 3 life, or you draw a card. Now, this is super important because the fact it's got vigilance means you can attack and block, and every turn cycle, you can draw 2 cards. Or you can gain 6 life, or you can have 2 tokens on the board. So, with this card, I would suggest... You this is an upgrade on the Keeper of Fables we talked about in the Commons Uncommons section. And this card is really useful. Again, it, it, this is a mythic though, so you'll have to make sure you've got the wild card tokens for it. The third card we're going to add is called the Questing Beast. The Questing Beast is a fantastic creature. It's a 4-4 with Vigilance, Death Touch and Haste. It can't be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. The combat damage that will be dealt by creatures you control can't be prevented. And whenever Questing Beast deals combat damage to an opponent, it deals that much damage to a target Planeswalker that player controls. It can't be blocked by small minions. It has Death Touch, so if they have a super huge creature, you can just take it out by blocking with it. And yeah, it's just a fantastic creature. This is an upgrade on the Leafkin Avengers in the deck. The next card we're going to look at is the Scavenging Ooze. The Scavenging Ooze is a 2-mana two 2-2 two, two, with a 1-forest tap ability where you tap a forest, you exile a target player from a graveyard. If it was a creature card, put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on Scavenging Ooze and you gain 1 life. So this is a replacement for the Nessian Horn Beetle. It has more reliable token generation and also can remove cards from an opponent's graveyard, which can be useful against black decks. If you note, it says exile target card from a graveyard. It doesn't have to be your graveyard. So the way this deck works is we're getting creatures out, we're attacking, we're being aggressive, so they'll be blocking with creatures. You can then remove those creatures from the opponent's graveyard, gain life, and grow the Scavenging Goose. So it's just a much more reliable card than the Nessian Horn Beetle. And now we're going to be looking at some lands as well. There are these double colour lands which are super useful. In our current deck, we have the Rugged Highlands, which give one life. The Temple of Bandon, which we have one of, 
uh, it gives you the scry ability. Scry is much more important to this deck than life gain, especially if you've added in the Elder Gargaroth. You'll be gaining life anyway, potentially. And having scry just means you can make sure you can draw what you want next turn. The second rare land type is the Crag Calm Pathway. The Crag Calm Pathway is a flip card, which basically you can choose whether it's a mountain or a forest. Obviously, this is much more versatile than having a basic land. You can have two of these in rather than one forest and one mountain. You know that when you draw it, you can definitely hit which color you need on the board. And the final land I'm going to suggest as a potential addition to the deck is actually called Fabled Passage. This is a colorless land that you have to sacrifice it and you search for a basic land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. So the idea is you, if you have this in your hand, you play this turn one, tap it, sacrifice it in your opponent's turn one to get your color land on the board. So then turn two, you've definitely got another land. This card is useful in any multicolor deck. So if you do craft some of these, you'll get a lot of value out of these as and when you start brewing decks. So on the screen is the deck with the first round of changes. I added in two Grom Gullies, two Pride Malkins, a Brontosaurus and a Keeper of Fables. I removed two of the Unleashed Furies, both Dreamstalker Man's Cores, a Warden of the Chain and a Rampart Smasher. The MTG Arena import is in the description. So as you can see now we are in a game with the changes. We are against a mono blue deck which looks to be a mill deck. We already have our Grom Gully and Pride Malkin on the board. So this should hopefully highlight how this combination works. We're not in the best position mana wise, but board wise, we're in an okay spot. We're also drawing our Thrashing Bronson on the field and utilize his ability to get rid of what could have been a very strong threat to us. Our opponent cast a Relic Golem, which is a 6-6 six, six artifact creature. Thankfully, we had the Bronson in our hand, so we cast it straight away and use its sacrifice ability the turn it's played onto the battlefield to eliminate the threat. We did this in the first turn it was on the field because our opponent was tapped out so we couldn't prevent it happening. This next segment of play is highlighting the power of having all our creatures with trample. Mill decks don't generally run too many big creatures, so we can now attack and pressure the opponent to block him with his creature that causes us to mill. And whilst we're doing this, we're also causing damage to the opponent's life too, which further adds pressure. The main aim of the deck is to try and get early pressure to disrupt our opponent's play. The Grum Gully Pride Marking combination is enabling that in this instance. This next play is interesting as it highlights one of the considerations you need to take when playing against blue decks. We could have tried to cast our Rampart Smasher, but we play the Hornbash Mentor instead. The reason we do this is twofold. One, if it resolves, it would get counter on it and trample. But if it's countered, we have enough mana to play Ram through, which we can remove the crab that's been causing so much mill. When an opponent leaves a mana open, especially with blue decks, it's worth considering that they have a counter. So playing around that is an important part of magic. In this instance, the Horn Bash Mentor is indeed countered and we get to remove the crab which caused us so much mill. As the game further progresses, we are now really putting pressure on them as they've got a low life total. We're really utilising the fact that our creatures have got trample. Here we have the Rimrock Knight which ha has an ability to add to our creature's power. This means we can take out their last large 0-4 defender and also get an extra point of damage onto their life total. At this point their deck isn't close enough to milling us so we go on to overwhelm our opponents and win the game. So as a final note for this video this deck is in no way means complete but I hope it adds some insight onto how to improve the starter deck. I will have some follow up videos where we further improve it once we have more games played with it so we can see where it needs work. We'll also look to maybe at you some of our rare wild cards as well. Thank you for watching this video. If you like the content, please subscribe. Also, if you have any other suggestions for the deck, please comment below. I'd love to hear your ideas.